Hello, my name is Fabian Gandon. I'm a research director at INRIA, and together with Professor Wendy Hall from the University of Southampton, we wrote this article, a never-ending project for humanity called the web. So in this paper, we give an overview of the main historical steps in making the web. We start with some of the influences and stream of thoughts that predate the web. Then we give some of the important steps in weaving the web. And we finally have a third part on the different mutation and challenges of the web. So starting with the prehistory, we human have been trying to organize and access masses of information for a long time now. One of the early work we wanted to mention today was the work of Paul Outlet in 1910. His work on collecting and archiving and indexing and categorizing documentation was called the Mondaneum. And in his building of the Mondaneum, he foresaw a world where we could network all sorts of sources of information, a worldwide network environment. In 1945, Vannevar Bush wrote an article called As We May Think. In this article, he identified the need for a machine to help follow information development, a machine that he called the Memex for memory extension. In this machine, we would be able to externalize the point and links of association, quoting the association of thoughts in accordance with the intricate web of trails carried by the cells of the brain. In his article, Vaneva even envision that one day we would all be carrying cameras and generating so many pictures that we would have to um, have the help of a machine to organize all these pictures. 20 years later, we have the computers and Ted Nelson can propose a file structure for complex, changing and inter indeterminate information. He called that structure the hypertext to link the text document and in general, hypermedia to link media of any type. It's a data structure to store and connect digitally anything. Then we can, over a period of 20 years, see several evolution in hypertext. The first generation of hypertext was mainly on mainframes and largely text-based. The second generation of hypertext was more advanced in terms of user interfaces was working on workstation with graphical capabilities, providing new interface features as graphical overviews and multi-user supports. The third generation of uh, hypertext was available on PCs. And just to give one date, in 19, uh, 1987, uh, HyperCAD was available for free on every Macintosh. And it was also the first year of the ACM hypertext conference. One very important thing happened during the third generation also is the crossing between internet and the hypertext with a number of projects such as HyperG, Microcosm, and of course, the web. So Tim Berners-Lee proposed in the 90s a first system at the CERN called Enquire. It was a system to arbitrarily and bidirectionally link document together and also supporting multi-users. Then in March 1989, he proposed a distributed hypertext system that he called the MESH in a document called Information Management, a proposal. So how did we weave that MESH? Well, first of all, we must notice that CERM was a perfect cradle for that MESH. It had a need for an efficient document system to allow the different scientists to exchange their result and the data and how to use the different pieces of equipment and so on. CERN was also the largest internet hub in Europe at the time, and it was using RPC, remote procedure call, that allows a program to call another program on another machine. It was used to programming approach to document writing such as uh, LaTeX or HTML. 
And also it was using some of the latest pieces of equipment and computers, such as the NextCube workstation, which offered an object-based and graphical programming interface, networking capabilities, multi-window interfaces, and so on. So there was, this was a perfect environment to weave that mesh. Uh, the idea behind that mesh was that link references would include network addresses to weave a mesh across the network, a mesh architecture integrating hypertext with TCP and DNS, integrating hypertext with the internet. HTML was proposed as a simplified language for web document. Clicking a link becomes a remote call for procedure, making the web less a network of document, and in fact, from the beginning, more a network of procedure that we now call REST architecture. The web was also conceptually open to writing things at the beginning, meaning that the first web browser were also web editor. Anyone could open a web page, watch it, read it, but also edit it. And the first server and first browser were called the World Wide Web, and this became the name of the whole thing. That's how we started weaving the web. The web is also striking a balance between the integration and the departure from the existing and emerging paradigm. It's breaking some of the threads of the uh, old hypertext system. Uh, some of the characteristic the web was based on was the generality and portability that were of greater importance than any other extension. It liberates the hypertext from the central servers the data and links were decentralized on the internet. The links became unidirectional and breakable. That's the birth of the 404 error. Breaks needed, these breaks were needed for scaling and for virality. These breaks, this difference from the um, previous hypertext system were required for the web to start. We can identify three pillars of the web architecture. The ability to name and reference any resource using URIs. The ability to identify this resource, but to have representation describing them. And the fact that we have a representation and resource oriented vision of the network. And the ability to negotiate the content we will obtain whenever we try to access one of these resources. And of course, which something which makes the, the web extremely appealing was that it combined in a single and simple and elegant architecture, all these three pillars, and that greatly contributed to the variety of the web. This uh, variety of the web is uh, summarized by the, the motto, build small but viral. It gives priority to general, generality, portability, extensibility, simplicity, elegance. Uh, so for instance, the fact that anyone could copy the code of a page, paste it in a new file and adapt it to make his own home page made the web, uh, web viral. It also harnessed the network effect. So by, for instance, by being systematically compatible with other system, the web integrated a lot of resources and very rapidly uh, reached um, the network effect. This retrocompatibility was also a show of the flexibility and the evolutive nature of the web. And the web was co-conceived, uh, co-designed, co-documented, and in fact, the documentation of the web was on the web itself. Another very important point is that in 1993, the CERN makes the web open source and free of rights without any fees. And one year later, the World Wide Web Consortium is created to um, um, take in charge the standardization, the normalization of uh, the web architecture. As soon as the web was born, it also started to have a number of mutations. So, in fact, we can say the web was born to be wide. 
in the sense that as soon as it started to be used, it started to evolve, evolve in many different directions and um, develop a number of mutations. So there are a number of them in the article. We just mentioned them. Uh, one direction was, of course, the advent of the mobile access to the web. Another one was the development of metadata and linked data on a semantic web, the development of a web for machines, and the development of web programming and the boom of web applications, the development of social medias and social network on the web, and other mutation, more recent ones, such as the web of things. If you want any detail on these, we uh, provide some in the article. The web also become a research object, an artifact to be studied. Why? Because the web is both well known and poorly understood. For instance, many people still make the confusion between the web and internet. The web is a software architecture, and it's also the object that emerged from that architecture. And both of these aspects, the architecture and the object that emerged from the architecture, they exhibit the complexity that calls for research and development approaches. This web is constantly bringing new solutions and new problems and new needs. So that's why uh, a number of researchers started the domain called web science, which is the study of the web evolution and its impact. And as I often say, I am convinced that we need to have the scientific approach. And I'm also convinced that the three W's of the World Wide Web called for the three M of a massively multidisciplinary method. We need a multidisciplinary science of the web. And we haven't seen the full potential of the web yet. Uh, it's clearly an arch architecture that has passed the test of time. It is omnipresent, it has hypermedia, and it has modified our relationship with time and space. Uh, there is an era before the web, and there is an era after the web. The web is known as an architecture, an artifact, a science object, an education topic, and we haven't seen the full potential of all these facets yet. And there are many stakes for the web. Neutrality, decentralization, democratization are some examples. There are dangers for the web. Recentralization, level of access, different speeds, and there are limitations, infrastructure need, energy, cost, and so on. And all these make the web a never ending project. So I thank you for your attention. And because we're talking about the web, we included a number of links here to continue. Thank you.